As Jeremy explained, I work on open source software for genomics, so I'm not a neuroscientist. I could talk your ear off about RNA and RNA biology, but, um, and the, some of the data I will present is uh, data from the brain, is transcriptome RNA molecules that are measured in the brain, but my anatomy is so-so, so please uh, bear with me. Uh, so let's get started. So what I want, before I get into the code that I've been writing, one thing I want to talk about is uh, concept that I, uh, issue that I've had in meetings with collaborators, I'm sure you've run into the same problem, where you'll present some result that you, you come up with this analysis, you've worked for weeks on it, and they say, well, what if you only did on this sample subset? What if you only use these features? What if you did this other combinatorially expanding number of uh, tweaks that you have to do? And you're like, well, oh, you want to do just a few more tweaks? You must be so good at computation because you think it's only going to take a few more days. So this problem is something that I ran into with my collaborators many, more, uh, many, many times, and this, flit this software is, is born as a result of that. So it is called Flotilla. We have a naval theme in our lab, or another um, piece of software from the lab is called Clipper. Uh, matches up with the biological technique quite nicely. But it's an open source Python package for exploring data. Currently, it's tailored to our specific needs of transcriptome analysis using uh, genes measured in the genome uh, from different cells, especially from, from us at a large scale, where meaning hundreds of samples, and this is, and genes are on the order of tens of thousands of features. There's about 30,000 genes in the genome, and then there's um, about a million different versions of those genes that we also measure. Uh, and so we're not quite in the exabyte scale. The demo I'm gonna show you is, uh, will be running in memory on my laptop. And I've come here to present to hopefully find collaborators. I think that while this, uh, while this software is currently tailored towards our research, I think it solves an important problem in terms of iterating quickly over machine learning analyses. And I hope you will find many um, parallels between your, your own research. So first of all, Flotilla is data. Uh, underlying every data that set that you have in Flotilla is a pandas data frame. If you haven't heard of pandas, it's a fantastic tool in Python for dealing with data frames uh, and munging them, reformatting them, filtering them, all kinds of things you may want to do. Uh, secondly, Flotilla is computation, and while the example I show here is scikit-learn is machine learning specific, we are looking to expand to other linear models or the statistical models. Um, I personally work with machine learning algorithms on the daily, so that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, but the, what I want to emphasize is that computation is a first class citizen in Flotilla. Um, so thirdly, Flotilla is visualization. So when you ever, you're, as you know, you're coming up with a result, you come up with a, uh, an algorithm, and you need to see what makes it better. And the best way to do that is to employ your visual system and see how much, how much more or less uh, the effect was. And we take advantage of these fantastic packages, matplotlib and seaborn, which is uh, the statistical uh, package built on top of matplotlib. Finally, fl flotilla is iterative. So I think this is a key point here. So um, the slides I'm presenting, I forgot to mention, but I just tweeted them. If you search for Olga Bot on Twitter, this is my pinned tweet if you want to check it out, but you can follow along. Uh, so the IPython notebook, which I'm presenting in now, uh, was recently merged to the Jupyter project, which is a language agnostic version of the IPython notebook. If you want to take a look, so it looks like this. You'll see an example of this where you have a code cell, and what's fantastic about these uh, IPython notebook is they've, in they've added the widgets. So what this is, is I wrote Python code, which then wrote JavaScript code. I didn't write the converter. That's for someone else. Uh, that wrote JavaScript code to then create these drop-down boxes and text input that I can use when I'm exploring my data that my collaborator who doesn't code, who is a biologist, has picked up and uses uh, from using Flotilla, from using our software. And you may be wondering why I described these, you know, four or five fantastic different uh, packages within Python, why would you just, why wouldn't you just use them individually for your own needs and uh, custom build everything yourself? And the thing is, th what we see Flotilla as is it shortens this distance between you have a hypothesis and then you can come up with a computational result um, fairly quickly. 
So let's talk hypotheses. Let's, how about the human brain? We are at a code neuro conference. Uh, we hypothesize that the human brain uses different genes, expresses different genes in different regions. Uh, so the data we'll be using is from the Allen Brain Institute. They have created a data set called the developmental transcriptome. So this is post-mortem uh, brain tissue extracted from many different indiv individuals, male and female, from several brain regions, and across the 13 developmental stages. Um, I wasn't sure how, how uh, familiar people were with RNA sequencing, so I'm just going to give a, a brief analogy. But if you think about uh, RNA sequence, think about that the, or the action originates first in the brain, then you think about this action, and then you actually do the action. This is very similar to what the central dogma of biology is, where DNA holds the key to everything that the cell could ever possibly do. RNA is the instantiation of that, or is the... Um, pre-instantiation of the, the thought of doing this, and protein is what we actually would like to measure, but we can't quite do it at the nearly as high throughput of a scale as we can with RNA. So RNA is our proxy to measuring what proteins are available in the cell. And the way so this is accomplished is we take, say, uh, this is a little small, so let's just look at the pictures. So these lines represent copies of an RNA transcript, so this is one molecule of RNA. Uh, Mo uh, multiplied several times, so we amplify it, shatter these amplifications, and then find where in the genome they align to. And then from these alignments, we can see which genes are expressed. And we use this using the most common tool is the Illumina sequencing machine. And Illumina is based in San Diego. So first we will load the data into Flotilla via our embark command. Notice the um, journey. All right, so we will, uh, so if you're not familiar with the with the IPython output, so this matplotlib in line indicates that we want our plots to be in line. We import our Flotilla data package, and we embark uh, using Flotilla, and I have this pre-canned uh, data set that I've cleaned uh, for, the, um, for not just this example, but for many others. So what just happened? A bunch of things happened. We parsed something, and then we initialized a bunch of predictors, and we initialized other things, and loaded other data. Um, but what really happened? Well, this brain span, this uh, flotilla dot underscore brain span is actually just a string to a package. And uh, so this is a JSON file. So in this, what this JSON file looks like, you can just get it really quick, is I'm not going to get too far into the specifications, but I got frustrated by having to, key to link together all our different data sets together um, what we're our rows and columns and making sure I know, because the, um, the gene IDs that we use, many genes have multiple IDs, so that we'll use the unique ID was ENSG, a bunch of random numbers, and you have to write converters for that. Anyways, so I found this great data package spec, which was written by the Open Knowledge uh, Foundation, who have created this specification of how you can ship groups of data together Using, um, using their spec, which is really great. So we found great use in this. Uh, so the point was that uh, this, there's, not, there's no magic, and this was reading from specific files from the internet uh, given by a specification. And now back to this hypothesis, we'll use principal component analysis to address this. So in case you're not too familiar with it, principal component analysis is one of many uh, decomposition algorithms where you can smush a multi-dimensional data set into two dimensions for plotting because I can't see in 30,000D, I don't know if you can, uh, but this helps me visualize. And uh, so an example here is that if you have three genes, you only measure three genes in your data set, what PCA finds is the axis of most variance, that's PC1, the axis of next variance is PC2. So PC1 is a combination of 0.1 times up gene 1 plus 0.2 times gene 2 and whatnot. So, so each component is a sum of the features in your data. All right, so let's get started. So we have this um, module interact or function interactive PCA. Uh, the data, we support both da expression and splicing data. We only have splicing data in this one. And as you can see, we have several different sample subsets. Options here, let's look at the graph itself here. All right. So just to point this out here, so these uh, orange squares are the uh, cerebellar cortex data. These purple triangles are the striatum. The, 
the teal squares are the medial dorsal something of thalamus. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the rest is kind of smooshed on top. And the, oh, and th this is the uh, orange triangle is the amygdala. And the, everything else is kind of smooshed on top of each other. So it looks like this difference between, between the cerebral cortex and everything else that was measured is contributing a lot to the variance. So let's take that out for now. Uh, just to warn you, our sample subsets are taken from the entire metadata data frame, so every possible option is there, so that's why this is really long. All right, so we want not structure name cerebellar cortex. There we go. Is, if it, this was the live IPython notebook, not the slideshow version, you'd see a black dot in the corner showing that this is still computing. For now, we just have to wait. Here we go. And so upon this, we can then see, okay, well, if we take this out, we do still see uh, separation between the medial dorsal thing and the rest of the, <laughs> the, rest of the data set. Uh, using uh, Flotilla, we can also take in a custom list. So I showed you how you can subset samples. Uh, feature subsets happen similar ways. What ha we get asked a lot is that someone says, I have my favorite list of genes. Can you see what happens here? So what you can do is in this list link uh, text box, insert your favorite gene list. This is uh, a Dropbox link to a file on my computer. It's a little circular, but uh, it does the job. So these are th what these ideas look like. They're really stupid. And these genes are cell cycle genes, and as you know, the, oh, and you also need to, so this is gonna give me an error now, I need to say that I want to use this specific custom list and not one from here. And as you know, m many of the cells in the brain are post-mitotic, thus they're not uh, going through the cell cycle anymore, so we wouldn't expect to see uh, great separation of the genes here, they should be expressed somewhat randomly. All right, and um, again, so we can do this uh, feature-wise, so it trans uh, transform your matrix, and we don't have any annotations on our features, that's why they're all in one pink club. All right. So next, let's take that, so we've looked at, we've explored our data from the uh, initial exploration, now we want to take a more biological hypothesis that cells in the hippocampus, for example, uh, have expressed genes that are unique to this specific function. If I understand it correctly, hippocampus is a, uh, involved in memory formation, so we hypothesis that there are specific genes that are only used in the hippocampus for this specific function. Uh, the default classifier that we use is extremely randomized trees. What this means is that we take uh, random subsets, uh, so this is in scikit-learn, we take random subsets of data, su subsets of samples, subsets of features, fit a tree, fit a decision tree to uh, that subset and see how well that tree works outside of that subset and do that many, many thousands of times. We see each feature many times. All right, so let's run this classifier. All right, and we want our variable to be the, um, whether it's a hippocampus or not. We want structure acronym HIP. Oh no. Here we go. And we'll want to use all genes. So what I was showing before with the variant genes, uh, this is a filter that we use just so the computation is a little faster. It's the genes or features whose variance is two standard deviations away from the mean variance of all features. Uh, it just makes a nice cutoff because it's like a quarter or less of your genes or 10% of your genes. <laughs> All right, so uh, what I want to show is that once this finished, so scikit-learn has some parallelization and uh, just to remind you, this is being done in memory on my laptop. We, our data isn't so huge, but the idea here is that this shows the different features that we found, how uh, important they were given in the, uh, this out of bag score um, that I mentioned, wh how well that, those, that feature set performs on the samples held out of the bag, the initial bag. And, uh, and in the pink, you see the samples that are not hippocampus, and the blue triangles show the ones that are hippocampus. It's a little small, but uh, in the upper corner here are three, three genes 
uh, Fox J1, C1, ORF88, which is soon to be renamed as uh, PT, uh, as Pitchfork. It's been a, it's a gene that's been ex uh, described in mice and rat. And TECT1, they're all involved in the development of cilia, it uh, turns out. Um, I was pretty surprised by this. Uh, again, I don't know too much about the um, memory development, but it did seem, so these cilia are these finger-like protrusions from cells that can be used to reach. And it seems like there's been proof or shown that uh, cilia are important for memory formation. So it, it does seem uh, quite interesting that with a simple classifier, with a simple, not just simple classifier, with a uh, quick method, we were able to come up with some real biology. And I'm sure you can think of other situations where you can come up with a quick question and come up with some real answers. So there's a couple different kind of emerging tools for piping together pipelines for data. I, that's poorly stated. Uh, so like I use batch jobs for R, there's this thing called Nextflow, there's this thing called Big Data Script, there's a couple of these things co just coming up and everybody's kind of saying, oh, we, need something, we needed something and we built it up and this is great for us and it's still in beta and you should join us and use it. But there's like five of them now or something. So have you looked at the others? Have you chatted with the other people to see whether there's some commonalities? Because it seems like, I don't think any of the other ones are meant for the kind of data you deal with. I think yours is not meant for the kind of data de they deal with, so there might be some room for kind of collaboration and growth there. I haven't heard about those packages because at the time when I was trying to do these things, they weren't out yet. Uh, and I have been talking to uh, somewhat um, perpendicular groups, so groups that are, uh, there's a startup called DAT, or D-A-T, uh, and so they're trying to be a GitHub for data to be able to share data very quickly. Um, my dream is to be able to take any published data set, bio a biological data set, and embark on anything and say, okay, here's a paper ID, I want to, I want to start analyzing their data set. Uh, and I do think there's a lot of parallels, but I would love to hear about these other projects. Sure, yeah, I'll catch you later on them. All right, and I just want to acknowledge uh, people in my lab could not have been done without Michael Lovesey, who spearheaded uh, and did a lot of the work for uh, initial work for Flotilla, and Yan, who is the experimentalist who also uses Flotilla and will send me bug reports in the forms of coming up to my desk <laughs> <laughs> oh, and funding.